Hello, beautiful co-creators of the new paradigm. I'm Mitika Kolov and I'm here with my guest speaker, Ethan Fox. Ethan and me, we met after uh, doing an interview also uh, on YouTube, uh, which has been launched on his channel and I will put the link below. Uh, and after the interview, we got talking a little more about what he actually does in his life. And there are so many amazing things that this man is doing that I just felt like we have to share this. <laughs> so I am offering uh, a bigger platform and I suggested to Ethan we would make a video and I would share it on my YouTube channel. So with all of you awesome guys, because the one subject that I want to put a spotlight on here is um, conscious schooling for kids that have certain gifts and feel they are more aware, more awake, and to serve those children's needs. And that's exactly what Ethan is uh, doing and providing with um, a plan that's called Conscious Youth. And Ethan, could you tell us more about that, please? Hi, we took it. It's nice to be with you again. And thanks for having me. Uh, well, Conscious Youth is a program that we've had for several years now in our, in our local area. Uh, we're based in, in Michigan in the United States, and we've had it for about three years now. And it started out as a, as a local program for just some of our local kids who were highly conscious and some of them very gifted, too, in different ways. And it was uh, an evening program and where they uh, got to interact with different expert teachers in different fields and, uh, and other kids like them. So initially... So we taught things like uh, channeling and medium. So we had professional intuitive channels and psychic mediums and and healers and aura readers and people teaching things like cranial sacral and raw food. Um, so every week they had a different teacher and uh, and they had an opportunity to learn those things and actually hands on practice them. Uh, and then every other week we also had a social because one of the things that we found that kids who are like that are having trouble is is that they don't have a lot of friends like them. Um, there are more and more kids being born today who are highly conscious, but, but they're still very few and far between in our current society, or they're very much suppressed and held back, and so they don't know that, and their parents won't make these kinds of things available to them. So, so we so we felt the social interaction was really important, and so the social event they just um, they had an opportunity to talk to each other and share their experiences that they've been having in their lives, and uh, and a lot of these kids are highly sensitive to their environments and um, very intuitive and very gifted in different ways, and they have no one to share these things with, and and many of them have had extraterrestrial contact too, which that's not the kind of thing you can talk to. Uh, anyone at you know at your school counselor or your right, school, school teacher, teacher or your parents, right? As you <laughs> as you, as you know, know. <laughs> uh, and so the social uh, opportunities really help them to open up and share those kinds of things. Um, so that went on for a couple of years, and um, it was overseen by by uh, local locally. We have an organization, and uh, Michaela Sheldon, who's an intuitive channel, and she's been on my show a lot of times. She uh, she started the Conscious Youth program with me, one who was overseeing that program over the years, primarily because her daughters, in particular her youngest daughter, was highly gifted and highly sensitive, and one of those kids who who didn't really have a lot of social interaction. And we built the program really for her in the beginning, oh, uh, and so a lot of local kids uh, joined. At any given point, we had anywhere between five and ten kids in the in the beginning of the program, and uh, and then eventually we evolved it into an online program where we had we used a web-based video platform uh, similar to Skype, but where where we had uh, we could have many kids on at any given time from all over the world. So so we carried that forward and we had educators teach virtually and had social interaction virtually, uh, and and that's uh, where the program was. Now we our next phase is is the next step in, in the long-term vision, and I can share the long-term vision in a minute, but the next phase is for us to have a physical um, three-day weekend um, program. And so we've already selected the venue here locally um, to essentially what we want to do 
is we want to create a Harry Potter type of school experience for the kids, something that's really fun and mystical, but, but at the same time, teach them real things. And what a lot of people don't realize is that they can, you know, much of what is shown in the Harry Potter movies is is becoming real in our current reality. We can do a lot of those things. And we've already organized many of the teachers. We want to teach the program. We have a, a local uh, guy who is quite gifted in telekinesis and um, aerokinesis. He can We've had him at our uh, conference, our Awaken Empowered Expo, where he's able to move objects um, underneath even a dome, uh, glass dome or change the direction of the wind or make clouds disappear. So that's one of the things that we're intending to teach. Uh, we have teachers who can teach kids telepathy within a few days. And that's actually um, recently I did a show with Mary Rodwell, who I'm sure a lot of your viewers know, and I know you know Mary. And um, Mary and I talked uh, in, independent of the interview, and we, uh, she shared with me that there are some educators who have been highly successful with teaching kids how to be telepathic within just a few days. So, so we intend to reach out to them and have them uh, teach at our program as well. And um, we have an aura reader who's local to us who, uh, who's extremely gifted in being able to see energy fields and also communicate with crystals and crystal energy so she'll be doing workshops in that uh, and we'll and one of the most important classes I think is is um, is psychology and we want the kids to be able to uh, because a lot of kids one of the biggest challenges that they face is they're living in in a three-dimensional world with parents and other kids that they're going to school with who are very much based in a three-dimensional mindset. And, and, and these kids are highly sensitive uh, to their environments. They're highly empathic. Some of them are telepathic. Uh, and um, some of them are dealing with extraterrestrial contact. And they don't really have anyone to talk to about these things or share these things or even make sense of what to do with these experiences. So so we intend to teach classes in helping them to understand their environment, how to um, how to deal with their hypersensitivity and, and find positive outlets for this and also environments to share the kinds of things that they've experienced. So we'll be having uh, having things like that. Uh, and the event, we intend to hold it. Uh, there's a uh, campground that we have been investigating because we want to also have outdoor fun activities and things like, you know, face painting and, and uh, kayaking and horseback riding and things like that in between the actual education programs. So, so we'll be teaching all kinds of really fun things like that and creating an environment that is really, um, you know, that, that's a really fun looking environment, not, you know, like a boring educational school, but, but kind of a fun thing. So it's a, it's an interesting new project of ours and that will be next year in the summer in 2018 uh, and uh, we haven't yet announced it yet we're still finalizing the venue and the speakers and everything but as soon as we or the teachers as soon as we have that worked out we'll be announcing that on our conscious youth facebook page and we'll have a website and everything set up for that when the time comes so that's a little bit of the background and what's coming uh, long term though um the intention of this is is to have a year-round school for kids from kindergarten through, um, you know, through high school, where where we're teaching things much more advanced than any schools currently are teaching, and, and also bringing in teachers who are on the leading edge of these fields, because most of our modern schools these days are teaching outdated or incorrect information, um, science that isn't really valid anymore, um, archaeological research and history that's not even correct. In most cases, because in most cases, because academics are very much set in their ways, and in some cases, because the government has an, uh, a personal um, gain in, in maintaining a certain type of mindset and understanding of history. So, so our intention is to bring in educators who are on the, in the leading edge and working in the field in these various areas from archaeology to science to intuitive development, to teaching all these, so teaching all these things to kids 
in in school. So so this uh, summer program next year is just our next step in that long term goal. Thank you, Ethan. Wow, this is absolutely mind blowing. And for me, when you just shared the little first bits of this, when we were talking about this the first time, there's a part of me that wants to simply jump up and down and uh, run in circles because I get so enthusiastic of all of this. Uh, you know, I certainly was one of those children who didn't know where to go with my own experiences and stories. And it feels like even to have somebody just plan this uh, in one once upon a time in the future is it sounds like a dream come true. I'm so grateful for what you're doing and all the people who are involved with this. Um, looking at education myself, um, so I don't have children. I know you don't have kids. You told me just a little bit earlier. Um, but I'm curious um, for you, you seem to know very well uh, to understand very deeply uh, what is needed in this sense. And I fully agree with every word you just said. Um, would you say that your own childhood contributed to this current desire? Do you feel that your, the way you experienced your school time um, is a part of this, uh, what you're doing now? Uh, not at all, actually. My, my childhood and school time was very conventional and I was raised, uh, I was originally from India and I was actually born in India and I came here when I was very young. My parents were very mainstream, my school education, everything was very mainstream. So none of that really had anything to do with it. It's just that um, I have, because of the work that I'm doing these days, I'm surrounded by incredibly brilliant, gifted people like yourself in all oh. different areas. and. And because and kids and children who are incredibly brilliant and gifted in all these areas. I mean, this is my whole universe now. And uh, I left a very conventional life many years ago, and now I'm fully immersed in and walking in this world that is, in many ways, a world of the future for most people. But for me, it's very much my present. So because of that i'm i'm really aware and because of having my show and our expo and uh, and all the kinds of people that it attracts not only as as teachers but also uh, attendees uh, i'm surrounded by people uh, adults and children who are like that and i have been for some time now and because of that i just have become aware of what the needs are and and for me it's really more uh, it's really more just um, a vision that I have for the future that I would love to create. And uh, and I don't really, uh, I'm of the mindset that I don't really let obstacles stop me from creating the, my vision for the future. So for me, it would just be a fun, exciting thing to to have something like that exist in the world. And I think it's very much needed. And I hear not only from adults such as yourself, how much whenever I met and whenever I speak with uh, adults about this project, uh, they get excited and they w want to be in the school too. So, so I know it's the right thing, right? I know it's it's timely, and I know it's something that's very much needed. And and there are so many kids out there who ha don't have the support, even with a lot of the more um, more futuristic schools or, or schools that are more open to this, such as Waldorf schools and and of that nature, they still are not advanced enough for the kids that are being born today. There, as far as I know, there is nothing out there that is that is like what we're intending to do. So, um, so it's you know it's an idea of the future. The biggest challenges we face are uh, not enough parents are conscious enough to allow their kids to participate in things like this. There are certainly plenty of conscious children out there, but the, one of the biggest challenges we faced over the years is, is reaching those kids with the parents who are, uh, who are conscious enough or at least willing to allow their kids to explore who they are. And uh, that may be the biggest challenge being pioneers in any field is that society isn't yet ready for it, but but we fully intend to be here 100 years from now and when society slowly moves in that direction. <laughs> wow, you will be the founder, perhaps, of a new system that could completely spread worldwide. Who knows? Yes. I would yes, love that. to see that and similar ideas grow. And I really believe the time is now. And uh, 
perhaps we are even a little uh, behind <laughs> in my fantasy, uh, but I'm so happy you're doing this. So um, what I was just curious about when you were a child, what you remember of your own childhood, do you feel, because you do energetic work, you, you offer uh, healing modalities, you work with people in very multidimensional ways, as I understand. Um, did you feel as a child um, misunderstood or is there anything of your own experiences there that is, is contributing to your passion and your enthusiasm for this? Well, I was, uh, yes, I was very much misunderstood as a child. Uh, now, um, I spent the first five years of my life in India and, and, uh, and actually in, a, in an environment that was much more spiritually based. But when I moved to the United States uh, to be with my parents, I actually grew up the first several years with my grandparents. And uh, I came here to be with my parents. And my parents were very mainstream. And uh, and I was as as a child I was much more advanced than um, than my parents in terms of my understanding at the time it was really more I had a fascination for technology and electronics and uh, so as a child I was writing video games and computer software when computers were brand new when I was you know, 12 14 years old so. Um, and building electronic devices and uh, alarm systems and things like that, much to their annoyance. Because um, I, would, I would alarm my bedroom door all the time and, uh, and they would set off the alarm when I was at school. So, <laughs> so these are the kind of things I was doing. Um, I wired the whole house with microphones so I could hear every room. And, uh, <laughs> so, so in, in so I was sort of this uh, you know genius little kid who got in got into all kinds of things like that, um, but but yes uh, at the time te technological advances like that were still very new. Computers most people considered computers just a toy. They didn't really take them that seriously then. So even my parents didn't really understand that the my interests and my abilities in those areas were advanced for children that age and so for them it was not something that they understood and so yes in many ways I, I felt misunderstood now my spiritual awareness wasn't my conscious spiritual awareness wasn't there at that time um, although I've come to find out in recent years that I came into this life at, uh, in, a, in a highly evolved state with certain energetic gifts that I now use on purpose um, but I didn't know that then. Um, so it was just something that operated in the background. And there's a collective consciousness that facilitates my energy work through this physical body. And uh, now because I have access to intuitive channels and aura readers and other very gifted people, I've had an opportunity to communicate with them and understand why I'm here and who they are. And, and as it turns out, they've been always using this physical body from birth for that uh, consciousness um, raising for people around me, even without my knowledge. So, so that was always there, but I didn't become consciously aware of it until not that long ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also think that um, there are many people like you yourself, like you just described, that had or were born in what seems a very, um, how do you call that, um, more generally oriented family, more the common uh, focus. Okay, you work, you you have your nine to five job, you earn your money, you pay your rent, you get a car, you get children. That's it. It's kind of <laughs> you get married. Um, these things, and um, without judging that in any way, shape, or form, I feel that there is a whole generation that was born in that and didn't feel um, at home in it. Like you just said, the three D world. If it's just that, you know. Because we are rapidly awakening, as I see around me as well, uh, on, in, all, in a lot of different ages, but definitely young people and the new generation are very, very far ahead and move very, very fast, um, that are becoming aware of their multidimensionality. And being aware of that just needs different kind of attention. Um, and I also was raised in a more standard mindset, although my parents were divorced and that but you grew up with your uh, grandparents, you said. So I think even in those early years, if something is different from the basic ordinary, like you get married, you stay together, you have your kids, that already actually helped me a lot in my own childhood to have a little bit different from 
the general to see um, that there are exceptions and this is also what I get a lot from my guide actually Arjun whom, whom I channel um, is that um, we can use all of these things that we perhaps first labeled as rough or hard as very positive and as gifts in our lives because they help wake us up and speed up our process so I feel there is a really enthusiastic generation right now because it has lasted so long this whole tunnel vision mentality so I feel like the, the, um, the momentum behind it, that's the word I was looking for, is really big at this point. So what you're doing, it, to me, feels intuitively like it could go real big, real fast. What are your thoughts about that? Well, certainly this is going to happen. It's, it's uh, whether we do it or not here is not what's what matters it's going to happen it's unavoidable it's going to happen so why are we doing it it's it's not that so much that we're doing it so that it can happen it's really the universe is willing it into existence and therefore right. we just simply decided to do it right um but if we don't then someone else will because and chances are as we're having this conversation there are other people in the world thinking of similar ideas because nothing really happens in one place only so yes consciousness will manifest itself in different areas at the same time so yes um so regardless this is an idea whose time has come and it will be here because the and even if uh, because the kids being born today just don't they're way more advanced than kids might when we were born and uh, and there isn't anything there to support them. And society as a whole is evolving. The really only thing holding it back is is the current three-dimensional structures that exist in our world. But those are starting to dissolve and, and evolve into something much more different. And so this is going to happen. It's inevitable. Um, and it's not us creating it is not a problem. It's easy for us to do this we, because... Uh, we have so many amazing people around us who are so gifted. So even, you know, uh, people on my show, people such as yourself, that's one of the really cool things about my life is I get to know people like you. And, well, beyond that, there's really nothing hard to do. Once you have the people who are able to teach these things, who right. are experts in these areas, well, the rest is easy. So... So it's just whether it's going to happen or not, of course, it's going to happen. It's and of course, we're going to do it next year. That's inevitable. And uh, it is going to become something uh, very, very substantial. Um, the biggest and the, I think the slowest part of the process is is that the a lot of these kids are born into households that are not that different from when I was a child. And with parents and this we come across this a lot uh, in in over the years running our conscious youth evening program we've come across this a lot it's not that the, there aren't enough kids out there who would benefit from this it's that there are not enough parents out there who are aware enough and open enough to allow their kids to participate in things like this to support their kids in uh, in um, becoming who they came here to be and expressing who they are in their fullness because a lot of times parents, I mean, parents have their own perceptions of reality and most are not able to uh, to um, be flexible with that enough to support their kids. A lot of parents really believe that they are here to teach their kids what they know and to evolve their kids in a certain way. But what they don't realize is kids come into this world already knowing what they need to know and their path is already set for them. All the parents need to know is to is to feed them and keep them out of, you know, harm until they're old enough to figure out what they're here to do, because the kids already know that. And if they just um, didn't uh, try to condition them and put them in schools that try to condition them to seeing things a certain way, then the kids would naturally find their way and uh, and do amazing things in the world. So. The, I think, you know, so that's the biggest problem is is the adults. But but that's going to change as the kids being born today become adults and become parents. I mean, it's just a matter of time. So mm -hmm. it, it the time is right. It's uh, but we are a little early. Um, but that's how I like to do things. I, I like to be a little early on the scene to do do things. It does make things more challenging because 
you don't have uh, as many, the masses aren't ready to, to participate in what you're doing. And so it's a bit more challenging, but, but I tend to like it that way. So, so it's I'm a nice totally, challenge. Yeah. I like the challenge. I think I wouldn't be surprised if through this kind of sharing this show and others, um, you might actually get busier than you think right now. I have a feeling also from watching some of my friends who have children here in Europe and hearing them speak about their children as teachers and really seeing in them understanding on a much deeper level how this is all co-created. Um, I feel there are more people ready for this than perhaps seem, seem to be out there because how many people talk about this? That's the thing. And, and you're making it a subject and you're putting it out on the table. So now we can jump in and uh, I would love people to like, please leave your comments below this video and uh, reach out to uh, Ethan. Um, just in between, I have some more questions, but just maybe you can already throw it in. Where can people find you if they want to know more about this uh, program of yours? Well, we're still working out the final details of the program and, and selecting the teachers. So we don't have a website for it yet, but we will soon. And uh, But in the meantime, you can find us on Facebook, just facebook.com forward slash Conscious Youth. The school won't be called Conscious Youth. The Conscious Youth is just the project name for the overall project of all of our kids' programs. Um, the school, that school actually is going to be called um, uh, the Seed of Life School for uh, for Gifted Kids, I believe. We are, It's still a working title, but Seed of Life, definitely. I don't know if you're familiar with what the Seed of Life is, but but it is an ancient symbol. And uh, so that will be the, the actual name of the summer program and the future schools that we plan to launch underneath that. Um, but they can currently find us in, on Facebook.com forward slash Conscious Youth. And then once the website's launched, that'll be announced there as well. Amazing. Thank you. And um, what are the ages that right now you are aiming for with the summer program? Well, our Conscious Youth program has always been for 9 through 18. So, uh, and now we may or may not take kids younger than that. The only reason is because we find that uh, usually, at least it has been the case, at age nine, they reach a certain level of maturity where they can interact pretty equally with kids, even of an older age. So, um, so we don't intend at the school to separate out by ages. Although, we may have programs. Um, we're playing around with the idea of maybe having two separate programs, one for the older and one for the younger, in two separate weekend events. That hasn't been completely finalized yet. But, but as a whole, we will be serving the nine through eighteen age group. Uh, and maybe selectively some kids younger than that if uh, if their maturity level is enough to be able to be in that environment. Okay, wow, that's exciting. So um, people just uh, contact you and then they can apply for this? Uh, yes, well, they can, they can just, um, first of all, I would join the Facebook page. And once we announce the classes there, um, they can, uh, we'll have the website and they can just simply go there and um, sign up for the classes and, uh, and we'll be having it in, I think I mentioned earlier, in a campground environment, but we'll be, uh, the, the kids and the parents will be staying at a, at a quality hotel nearby the campground. Okay. So, so all of that information will be available and we're still making the final selections of what those venues will be. Right. Um, but sometime in the next probably two or three months, we'll be announcing what those are and we'll, we should have the website and tickets or I'm sorry, the um, uh, registration and everything set up uh, probably within the next three or four months for that. Okay. Wow. It sounds so exciting. I'm super curious. <laughs> um, and I was thinking, um, so you have been doing these evening programs with children already for a few years. Is is that continuous? Is that still uh, happening? We we were until recently. We retired it. Although the only reason we did that is because we didn't have as much attendance as we had hoped in the remote program. So, but if uh, if people watching this show are interested, then certainly reach out on our Conscious Youth page and message us there. And if we have enough kids and parents who are interested in that, we would launch it again in the meantime, yes. Wow, that is such good news. That's really nice to hear. 
Um, and I was thinking just for the parents uh, that are out here right now, perhaps watching this and getting all excited, but also feeling that it's still maybe out of their league or range or they're like in this doubt zone, you know, um, what would you tell parents who perhaps suspect that their children have multidimensional experiences, but aren't quite sure about that yet? What can they do to support their child? right now what can what can they do for themselves within their family that feels easy to like do right now if they feel their kids have already had those experiences well the 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 most important thing i think kids like that they don't really feel like and if if the if a parent is watching this show chances are they already are supporting their kids because someone a parent like that would uh, would already be open to those kinds of things and would be supporting their kids in whatever way they can. The ma majority of issues that I find with kids like that is is that they um, they are they have a hard time functioning in regular society. They feel misunderstood. They um, they don't relate to con they find uh, conventional education to be very uncomfortable. So. One of the best things I would suggest is homeschool your kids or put them in some kind of alternative program that allows that doesn't restrict them or uh, try to force ideas in their mind that they don't really resonate with. Um, the more multidimensional the children are, the less they resonate with conventional education. So they find it very uncomfortable and in the rules and restrictions and those kinds of things so homeschooling is one of the best uh, things that i would suggest but more importantly i think just listening to them and uh, seeing what kind of experiences they're having and, and getting them in touch with people who can support them even if the parent can't support them there are plenty of very brilliant adults out there like mary rodwell or you who are experienced in these areas who can speak the language and who can communicate with kids like that on a level that they can understand right and so i think um, the most important thing the parents can do is to take the time to understand them and what they're going through and then find the resources if they're not able to support them themselves find the resources the educators or or sign them up and, and the other thing um, sign them up in programs like ours but but um, the other thing too is what one of the really important things in our conscious youth program has always been the social interaction. And that's because kids like that don't have friends like them usually. And they are, uh, they're, if there are kids like them in their own schools, which there, I'm sure there are, they probably don't know that they're like them because most kids like that keep to themselves. And, and in that conventional educational environment, they're not really um, comfortable sharing themselves. So a lot of these kids, they don't even open up until they're in our conscious youth program. A lot of the parents share with us afterward how surprised they are that their kids just completely opened up and talked about things that they never shared with anyone. And it's because they just don't feel comfortable sharing those things with just anyone. So you have to create a, a safe environment among peers who are like them, where they feel like they'll be understood. So, so the parents need to create environments like that, you know, find other kids like them or sign them up in programs like ours where they can meet other kids like that. Um, you know, it's a challenging environment because um, especially if the parents are not um, as uh, aware as their kids are, it can be right. hard to find. But most importantly, just stay out of the kid's way. You know, they already know why they're here. You know, they already know they will find their own path if you just don't interfere with them. Yeah, if you just let them be and show you or the world what is hiding inside and to give them a safe feeling and to invite them to play. And for me personally, the drawing and art was, was an amazing and beautiful outlet for me to, to process my own stories. But I was way out of the house before I started speaking about these things. So I think creativity can be uh, one language wherein some of these kids can express themselves. But if there's nothing there, then it's really, really hard. If there's nothing for them, like no music, no game, no playing outdoors or being in nature, connecting with an animal pet, or they often have many gifts they 
that they can use um, in beautiful ways if, if creativity is, is put out there as an option. So um, that's what I would probably recommend to parents to let them play and, and give them the tools and let them feel into what they want to do because yeah, nobody can think for somebody else. This, this is what we're continuously learning and what our whole society is learning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and, and along those lines, one of the most important things I think, it came out of my conversation with Mary Rodwell is that Many of these kids are, because they're so multidimensionally oriented, especially autistic kids, um, they are so hypersensitive to their environment that they respond to their environment in, in ways that the parents may interpret as being bad behavior. So, so if the kids respond in a hostile way, it may not be that the child is experiencing that but rather it could be the parent or somebody in their environment or at school and the child is picking up on the vibration of that emotion from that other person or group of people and reacting to that so a lot of times what the child is experiencing may not be the child's own experience right. which is one of the things that really needs to be taught in a school environment to these kids because i don't think many of them understand how to differentiate between what is theirs and what is somebody else's so so one thing that parents should be aware of is your child may be experiencing things that's that are really not their own that uh, that they don't know how to deal with just because they're receiving so much information from so many different levels at the same time where conventional three-dimensionally grounded people would not have that experience right right it can cause an overload and basically mm -hmm. blow the system in a sense and also the food maybe we can bring that in the idea yeah. of uh, so many children reacting in really crazy ways really acting out but you know their system is so much more sensitive like you just already pointed out um, also to sugars to taste enhancers to all kinds of additives so um, you're also speaking to people who are really um, scientifically um, schooled in this and what are you doing with that? Well, I, um, I've had a lot of experts on my show over the years and at our conference who are experts in health in different areas and well, First of all, I, I think the children already know what they want to eat and many even younger and younger kids these days are becoming vegan and forcing their parents to feed them vegan whether they like it or not, right? Uh, so I, I hear about this more and more often where the parents are just struggling with this because everybody else in the house eats meat and the kids want to be vegan. Where do they get that ridiculous idea in their heads, right? Uh, so they're coming into this world already with their preferences intact. And, uh, and I think the most important thing is that, that we allow them to be how they need to be because they already know. And if they want to eat meat, fine, let them eat meat. But, but, or if they want to eat something else, but I mean, certain choices certainly we should make, well, like avoiding genetically engineered foods, which are certainly not helpful. Um, but, but as far as um, I think more of these kids who are highly conscious are going to uh, turn out to be vegetarian or vegan. And it's just because they just don't resonate with it. Uh, it's not, I'd, in, in many cases, some adults these days, they're vegan or vegetarian for philosophical reasons. They don't want to hurt the animals or they, you know, other things like that. But I don't think it's really that for many of the kids. Uh, I think it's more that they just don't resonate with certain kinds of food. It just doesn't feel right to them. And the philosophical reasons may be secondary to that. And so, and they know their bodies don't resonate with that. So that would be, um, you know, something just to be conscious of. But, but certainly filter your water. We don't want fluoride in the water and genetically engineered foods. We want to try to avoid those or try to have, you know, have organic or grow your own food, uh, if at all possible. And, uh, things like that uh, and more live foods will certainly be beneficial um, now for some years i uh, i practice sun gazing and there are some individuals in the world who don't eat at all uh, and we are heading into a future where that's going to become a reality it's a little ways off but 
But ultimately, if we become more multidimensionally based, well, there's no reason really to consume physical food anyway. Um, but but for now, I, I think that's maybe a little bit radical. So, um, But I think certainly if we just allow our kids to eat what they want to eat, and uh, they'll naturally make the choices. And I find um, a lot of uh, people ask me about what kind of a diet is the best. And uh, I don't think any particular, I would make any particular recommendation there. Although um, a raw food, live food diet is very healthy. And I find more highly conscious people more often gravitate to that type of a diet. But I will say that every person's physical body and vibrational needs are different. Uh, some people need to be more dense because they're working in such a high multidimensional level that their body loses density. And so those people need to eat more dense foods. Um, other people, they are too grounded and, and eating live foods is great for them. So. Um, what I often find, though, and my recommendation is um, don't force yourself to have a particular diet, but right. allow the diet to choose you. Right. And I find um, in most cases, as a person becomes more conscious, they just lose a taste for more dense foods such as meats and things like, like that. And they just gravitate toward more live foods. It's not because they chose it willfully or for right. philosophical reasons. It's just they wake up one day and it just isn't appealing anymore. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I see food for now for myself. It's like a journey, what I eat, what I want to eat. And it's true, it's constantly changing. And I, I'm in an, uh, you could say an open dialogue with my diet because whatever wishes to change, I allow it. And then I feel into that for a while, see how that resonates with me and then but just like you said, yeah, I was one of those kids, the first one of my family to, to not want to eat meat anymore. And it was a complete drama and <laughs> I had to convince two households because my parents were split up, like I said. And um, it was hilarious. And another thing that I couldn't eat, and it's it, that sounds maybe almost autistic because uh, I couldn't stand the structure of it, was margarine. It's the stuff you put on your bread. Like since I was three years old or so, I was really, I didn't want it. And then maybe only five or six years ago, actually, now it's in the news, what's in margarine and like how chemically uh, composed it is and how what really nasty effect it can have on your body. Um, it's even being compared to plastics and it wasn't even invented to eat. It was some kind of substitute for something else after the war. Like, <laughs> And I'm so surprised that these things are coming up now. And how apparently as a child, I felt into that and I kind of intuitively knew this is not for me. Um, and like you said, it's, it's a combination. I think there is many, there are many children who um, don't want to eat meat when they figure out that it is from an animal. And this is another thing I would um, I promote in a sense, parents tell your child, what, what are we, what are you eating? Uh, just tell them because they can handle it and they can make their own decisions they're they're up for the truth you know and i think it's not fair to to give children food that they don't know what it is there's this videos now on youtube you know of a child that figures out for the first time that the chicken is actually the animal the chicken and then he he, he goes oh really super sad it's hard to watch that video without crying at least for me um because you can just see him go through all of these phases of sudden understanding that this is what's going on. And even though that's sad, I also believe it's part of our waking up. Yes, that's yeah, definitely. And um, well, of course, you would have that kind of an experience as a child, so I'm not surprised. Um, and, and, and that's not so unusual these days. More aware kids are, are like that. And, and as you mentioned, with the margarine, it was it's it's a vibrational sensitivity to food that the children are who are more multidimensionally oriented are having and so they just know vibrationally what is what resonates with them because ultimately all food is vibration it's all frequency it's all energy it may have physical three-dimensional substance to it but once it enters the body it it uh, the body uses the vibrational parts of it the energetic parts of it so right. that's ultimately what's the most beneficial 
and certainly there are certain physiological things that the body does with the uh, with the uh, more dense parts of the food but but it's ultimately a vibration and uh, and even me i i have certain affinity for certain kinds of foods i that don't really you know make a lot of sense and um but but just vibrationally uh they feel right to me so so that that makes a lot of sense and i think a lot more kids are going to have that sensitivity or just prefer certain foods and not want to touch other foods that's uh becoming more and more normal yeah and if that is a food because probably some parents are thinking now if i let my kids eat whatever they want they're gonna eat french fries every day and a part of me kind of feels like not that i would say do that or let them have that because obviously it's not healthy but overeating you know once or twice in your life at, at, when you're a child that is usually usually a very uh, strong way to learn what you don't want at least i remember from eating too much chips <laughs> You know, you're 12 years old or something, you have a bag, you have another one, oh my god, and you're not allowed to do that, but you do it anyway. And the way your belly feels after that, it's a great way to learn, okay, this is not a food that resonates with me, although it's a bit of an old paradigm way to figure it out. But some of us learn that way, some of us learn because they simply know already and they have resistance to other foods. But I agree with you, I think deep within we already know. And I think it's also very important for children to learn to become aware of how their body speaks to them in response to a certain food. And of course, there's this little nasty pitfall for many where we are being raised to believe that if we're good, we can have a treat. And there's so many parents who are still like adults who are still living that way. And that has made food for many people into kind of a comfort solution for many things. And it is still for many children. So I think it's important too for parents to teach the children that the feeling good is within you and you can access that at any time. You don't need a treat from the outside world or anything really. So when once children have that foundation, they can grow in any direction um, much faster, I believe. Yeah, I think I think you're. You, we have to separate when we're talking about food. We have to separate many different ideas because some children have a predisposition to French fries because their parents like French fries, right. and 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 so their mom drank wine. So the kids grow up and like to drink wine. There, there's certain. We're starting to understand now that our DNA, our genetics transmit more than just physical characteristics. So conventional science would say, well, you, your nose is, is the way it is because you're, one of your parents had a nose like that or something. So, but what we're finding is that um, preferences to food are actually transmitted genetically um, or even certain types of interests or spiritual gifts and abilities are transmitted genetically. A lot of times you'll find, um, so for example, if you were to have children, your children will probably be highly gifted in some way or another, um, more, most likely along the lines of your own gifts. And of course, you, you know that um, quite often um, extraterrestrial contact happens in a lineage as well. So. Um, so there are genetic qualities that are transmitted that our conventional science doesn't yet understand or explain, but the, those genetic qualities will carry food preferences, will carry psychological predispositions, um, spiritual gifts, all kinds of things that currently we categorize as junk DNA, but are actually valid and uh, important things to, to consider. So if you have a child who craves French fries, it's probably because you crave French fries and uh, or, you know, the parents crave French fries. And but for the most part, I find that the more and it's really we have to separate children who are still very three dimensionally based and children who are more multidimensional because multidimensionally based kids tend to have their own food preferences based on their own sensitivities to vibration. So, and so those kids are less likely to, to overeat uh, hamburgers and fries 
because they have sensitivity to what they should and shouldn't be eating, and they generally will gravitate to very specific types of foods. Um, but but yes, in, in societal conditioning is a factor too. If you if they go to conventional schools and watch a lot of television and eat conventional foods, then they're going to have some psychological conditioning there too. Majority of people in our society today don't really know who they are because they've been conditioned in a society that has certain philosophical understandings and certain kinds of marketing and uh, education to where I think the majority of people don't really know what they want and don't really know who they are and food preferences being one of them. Um, I doubt that major if, if we were left alone to make our own choices as children, that we would end up eating the kinds of things that we do as adults. So there, it's, it's, it's so food is a very complex subject that isn't um, very easy to quantify like that. But but um, but I think parents need to help their kids make some good choices in the beginning, and and then from my experience, if the children are taught those healthy choices in the beginning, they'll generally make healthy choices later in life. So now in my case, uh, I actually made my own choices. Um, my diet has always been different from my family, my immediate family and my extended family. Um, I've been most of my life vegetarian, vegan, raw food, live food. Uh, and, and for the most part, my family thought that was a ridiculous idea. And they still do. So, uh, but but I was one of those kids who, now as a kid, I didn't eat that way. But as soon as I could make my own choices as an adult, I that's the direction I went. <laughs> Same for me. Same for me. I'm still bringing like little boxes with stuff to any family gathering because I'm the weirdo that doesn't eat that and that and that. <laughs> Yeah, I just it's, don't eat when I go to family things. <laughs> yeah, basically the same. So I just bring my own stuff and they're used to it now. But when I bring a raw food apple pie, they're like, oh, can I have a piece? You know. <laughs> and the funny thing is I introduce these things to them by bringing them along. And it's still, still there are some people who are like, when you mention what you don't eat, they're like, what do you eat? Like there's nothing left but carrots, but it's not like that. I've actually never eaten um, as with as much variety and as healthy as I'm doing now, when you really dive into a healthy vegan diet in a, in a fun way, there are so many things you can do. And especially right now that the internet is overflowing with fun recipes and how you can do raw food at your home. And it doesn't have to be really time consuming. Um, although of course it takes some time to look into it in the beginning, but I think it's these first steps that most people blow out of proportion and then just shove it aside as being impossible. Whereas I believe and, and have experienced and I'm living <laughs> the proof that it is absolutely possible and even on a low budget because most of the time I did it over a very low budget. So it's just a matter of passion and making um, decisions out of love for yourself basically because it's a self-love thing eventually i guess but it needs you need to get that from within and let it speak freely or have somebody remind you of that i guess along the way and it's very valuable for children to in an early age uh have that kind of um reflection being provided to them as you're doing with this school so i love that even food is on the program um as a topic to discuss um, and then there's telekinesis and you go horse riding for an hour and you go <laughs> it really sounds like like wonder world it's so amazing yeah. i absolutely love it and we <laughs> intend to have a uh, live food um food live food that's uh, prepared for the kids wow. and also have them have prepared their own too yeah i was gonna say i loved helping me in the kitchen when i was younger T to be able to do mm -hmm. a thing it also gives you a sense of um maybe it doesn't uh, the translation doesn't sound, but being uh, useful, you know, I loved helping my mom in the kitchen because it felt like, cool, I get to do some real creating thing <laughs> that the adults usually do. But so I loved it working in the kitchen and I still do making my own new experiments with uh, life foods amongst others. So yeah, it's so much fun and there's so much that we can plant at an early age and see blossom later. And I love that you're creating this platform for just that. It's really beautiful.
-hmm. So are there any last things you would like to say about this school and dreams where you hope it's going or envision it's going or might go in other places in the world that you want to finish this off with? Sure. Well, the, the long-term vision, as I mentioned earlier, is we intend to have a year-round school for kids, which will probably launch initially here in our local area. I mean, everything we're doing, we have many projects and everything we're doing, we're ramping it up slowly, taking one step at a time in a direction. So our summer program next year and then eventually having a year-round school, which will probably be based here, but I'm not sure about that yet and then uh, eventually launching satellites of that school around the world. But my long-term goal is, is to go even beyond that to support those kids as they're growing up and, and uh, even having a university level education on that level. So having these kinds of programs available and, and we find, I mean, nowadays, uh, and has been the case for a long time, our education system is very much um, uh, created to condition our understanding and most of it's outdated or incorrect and um, because of the the availability of all the different people that I meet from our conference and um, uh, our expo or uh, and my show and all kinds of things like that we have access to people who are on the leading edge who are actually doing the the breakthrough work in different fields like archaeology and and uh, a variety of things. I mean, most of the archaeological research being taught in schools is outdated or completely wrong. So, so I tend to have a university level education where we bring in the actual people in the field on the leading edge doing the breakthrough work to teach these programs and, and also teach um, some of the more advanced multidimensional sciences as well. So the long term vision is to have a university level program for, for people. Yay. I can only think one thing while you're sharing like that, and it's gratitude, like really gratitude. This is so beautiful. I'm so happy you're doing all of this. And um, well, we will put all the links below. So when people are looking for maybe also some major names that uh, are perhaps going to work with you, we can put some things below and they can look into it, feel into it. and. I would say to everybody, continue to visualize, to dream, and to just imagine that it's already there. Because in a sense, it is, and I know you know it, and keep on doing that, because with that, we are bringing it down to earth. Uh, and by taking the steps in that direction with our actions, eventually, for those who feel really called to do that. But even by just imagining it, we are holding the space, and that's something pretty big as well. So I thank you, Ethan Fox, for making those really practical moves and making it happen for all of us, <laughs> for this planet. Thank you for being on the show and everybody, thank you for watching. I love you so much. See you in the next video. Ciao.